I'm going to try to make this presentation as interesting as possible, but we have a lot of numbers to share with you this morning. <laughs> we will conclude this session with um, Nikki sharing some information with us from RSA. Um, so I think that this is really important information that we share out to all the program managers, whether you are here today or if for those of who weren't able to make it. We want to make sure that they also get this information. Um, one of the things, uh, Nikki and I were just briefly talking um, before we started, and I was thinking maybe I should just do a brief um, overview of like how we're funded, because um, we have a lot of new people. And you might not realize that um, the OIB TAC is funded in the same way that the other TAC centers for VR are funded. So when the WIOA legislation was passed in 2014, they established a number of technical assistance centers, and I think all of them except for ours relate to VR. Is that correct, Nikki? Yes. Yeah. Um, and we are also unique in that we are the only TAC center that is disability specific. So we sit in a very unique place. Um, so the funding for the Title VII Chapter Two programs, which is what we're all funded under, um, that funding under WIOA was increased just slightly to account for our funding. So when you look at the total funding for the Title VII Chapter Two program, it went up um, about I don't know two two three percent something like that so we're funded at that percentage of the total funding the national funding um, and, and uh, so we're we're supported really under the the same funding stream as as the direct service programs but we support all of you and all of our service services to you and resources are completely free nothing um, nothing has a charge to you for, you know, attending this conference or um, unless you had more than one person from your state coming, you know, we, we are only supporting one person per state, but, um, you know, or accessing our website, taking our courses, all that stuff, because it's developed under the grant, it's free of charge. So um, are there any questions about any of that before we jump into this morning's presentation? I, I just don't want there to be these questions that you're like, how does that happen? <laughs> how did we get here to be in this <laughs> meeting today? So, all right. Hearing no questions, I'm going to jump into our slides. Um, in this session, we're going to talk about information across OIB programs. So we're gonna look at some numbers that will give us some information. We're going to talk about differences and similarities, and we're going to consider ways to increase consistency. Um, information that we present during this session is primarily from two sources. Um, the one that, that Jennifer and I will be sharing is from our um, needs assessment survey that we do um, each year, and we launched this back in October and I think we closed it in January because we wanted as many states as possible to participate. So 47 out of the 56 DSAs that receive OIB funding started the survey and about 38 of you completed it. So um, that gives you an idea. We had pretty good participation rate. Um, <clears throat> we also pulling information, uh, the part that Nikki will be presenting from is from the 7OB reports and she has some numbers to share with you from the last two years since we've moved to the new um, 7OB form. Okay, next slide. The challenges to consistency. So the data itself, we know, is not consistent. This is not something that um, is a surprise to any of you who've been around a while, and for those of you who are new, I'll give you just a few examples here. <laughs> so, for instance, um, I and some others have observed that in some of the recent 7OB reports, 
for instance, and, and I'm not calling anybody out by name here, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad, but just to show you that there are inconsistencies. Um, one state, for instance, reported that they have something like 4,000 FTEs. So <laughs> I think that they just got a heavy finger when they were on the zero, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> um, another state, for instance, and I think numbers may have just gotten into the wrong box in this situation, like about 50% of the individuals they served um, did not uh, select their gender. So um, I doubt that is true, but I guess it could be. Anyway, just interesting things that make us say, hmm, you know, how much should we rely on this data? And I'm only pointing it out to say that, that we really can't rely, even though it gives us a picture, um, it's still a pretty cloudy picture. So the needs assessment is also not completely accurate. For instance, I had a state reach out to me um, because they said, well, we don't have any certified people in our state. How can we get a certified professional TORC in our state? And so we were having a conversation about that, but when I went to the needs assessment and looked, and, and by the way, this is not a, an anonymous survey, so I can see who completed. <laughs> <laughs> who wrote the answers, I know which state it came from. So for that state, when we ask what percentage of your staff are certified through ACV, REP, or NBPCB, they said 100% of their staff were certified. So <laughs> um, what I'm reporting to you today um, and what Jennifer will be sharing with you is all from the needs assessment and we are sharing what you said to us. We did not adjust anything based on our knowledge of something that we are pretty sure is not correct. So, so that's why I just want to point out that, the, that although it's a picture, it's a cloudy picture. Um, okay, so secondly, another reason for inconsistency is we have a variety of program models, and we talked some about that yesterday, that we have contracted services, we have in-house services, and we have combination services. So not just our the, the states diverse in their model of services, but we also have cultural expectations that we have within our programs for, for how we expect services to look. An example that I was thinking of when I wrote this was how some of us um, are more on the structure discovery side of things and some of us are on the more traditional side. And what that really means, practically speaking, um, is that for those states who rely uh, or, or focus more on the structured discovery model, that they're really focused on the non-visual skills and techniques that need to be used to complete tasks. Whereas the traditional model leans a lot more to the side of using low vision to complete skills. So, um, you know, it's not that one is wrong and the other is right. It's actually a combination of the two. So coming from direct service, I know that, that you need the combination and it's part of that informed consent. You know, if people don't know that they could use a non-visual skill to complete something, then how can they choose to do it if they don't know that it exists or how to do it? Um, likewise, if they don't know that there is a low vision way to do something, how can they select to do that if that would be more efficient for them. They don't even have that choice if we don't tell them about the different options. So it's not that one's right or wrong, it's just differences in how we, we approach services. Um, lastly, we have a lot of diverse opinions and experience levels um, about services. And this I was thinking more about um, as program managers, how we approach services based on you know, our background. So for some of us, we come out of VR and we're seeing everything through that VR model. And that's, that's what we've seen. And even though there's a lot of similarities to VR, it's, it's not the same as VR. So, um, and I hope you're realizing that if you came from that, that side of things. But on the other hand, you know, those of us who didn't even come out of VR, we might not even have that perspective. So we're going to see things very differently. And depending if we came on to this program as a direct service provider that came up through the system and kind of got the experience to become the program manager, you know, that gives us a really different perspective than if we just came from management into managing this program. So yeah, we just have, we come from so many different places. That's, 
part of, part of why we see so many differences, in my opinion. This is one of the most interesting things that came out of the survey when I looked at the responses. And again, we'll take it with a grain of salt because we really don't know for sure. But we asked two separate questions on the needs assessment survey, and it looks like they are interconnected. So um, on the screen, there is a chart. And across the bottom is the amount of time that a program manager commits or is being paid to work on the, OI, the management of the OIB program. So we had different percentages here. So the second question, which is on the, the left column, basically, so um, it's a line chart. So on the left column, we ask a question about confidence in being able to administer all the parts of the OIB program. And the answer choices were yes, confident, um, partially confident, and no, not at this time confident. Okay, so um, so we've represented those in on the left hand side with zero for no, not at this time. We had partially confident as 50% and completely confident as 100%. So um, let me just describe this a little bit for those of you who can't see the chart. Um, we had six individuals that said that they could spend 10% or less time in managing the program. And we have all the way up to 100%, and they're just in, in set ranges that we had as, as drop-down choices for this answer. Um, so out of those six people that said they had 10% or less, four of them said that they were partially confident, and one said they're not confident at this time. Um, and only one individual said yes, they were confident in that, in that group. And then the next, all the way up to 50%, we had another four individuals that said they were partially confident, and two individuals that were, had more than 50% time said that they were partially confident. So you can see, um, and everybody else said that, that yes, they were confident. So, you know, we have a big grouping under that 50% and really clustered under the 10% range that said that they're not confident. So it appears, it appears, I mean, this is really just general observations here, that the amount of time you can commit to the program relates to the confidence level that you have in administering the program. And I will turn it over to Jennifer to talk about the next couple questions. One thing we also realized uh, when Kendra was gathering and sharing the data was that sometimes there may be inconsistencies in just the way people interpreted the questions, even on the needs assessment. So this was a good opportunity for us to take a look at ways maybe we can rephrase things to help gather data that's more consistent as well. And so um, one area that we looked at was community outreach. And the question that we asked was, um, and the statement was, the program has written policies or guidelines or specifies in the contract what capacity building activities should be completed. And um, examples of these include um, community awareness and networking, educational presentations, um, or outreach and um, identification of local resources. And so seven respondents said no, 11 said partially, and 25 said yes. Now this, the way the question is worded doesn't mean that the seven that said no don't do these capacity building activities. The question asks, do you have a written policy or guideline, right? So they still may be doing those activities. So how you ask the question makes a difference, right? Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, so also related to outreach, um, when it comes to reaching the underserved. So the question that we asked was, uh, the program has an outreach, uh, let me try to read my, an outreach strategy and designated staff uh, or contractors to identify an outreach to unserved and underserved individuals who need services. Five respondents said no, 
six. Um, expect their contractors to do this, but it's not in the contract. 16 said partially, and 16 said yes. All right, next slide, please. So of course, when you do a lot of outreach efforts, hopefully the result is that you get new consumers. And so we asked about the number um, new to OIB services. And we asked what percentage of the um, individuals identified uh, in your program for fiscal year 2021 had not previously um, you know, been receiving services, so brand new. And we had uh, two ways to respond to this, estimated and from data. And for those who estimated their numbers, we had a range from 30% to 85%. When it came to those that answered this question from data, the numbers were 39% to 51%. And there's a big difference, right, between 85 and, and 51. Um, question to all of you, if, if for those of you that didn't answer this question based on data, what data did you use? Because we didn't specify that in the question. We were just curious if anybody wants to volunteer, what data you use. And I'll repeat your answer through the microphone. If anybody remembers. This is Matt. Uh, we added it to our case manager report um, to be able to track that. And it should be safe to quit. <laughs> yes, so Matt from Alabama says that, he, that they added an item to their case management system to track this. Okay, so Sandy says in the case management system in South Dakota, um, when they open a new case, they can see how many previous records there are for that individual. So that tells them. So there's discussion about if AWARE can track who are new and Amy from New Hampshire says, yes, for that a person can do it. She doesn't know how and maybe ZZ knows. I couldn't hear what you said, ZZ, do you know? Okay, the data person can do it, okay. So that's the answer to that. So I do think that this is interesting information if we can get um, some reliable information on it. I think it tells us something about our community outreach, whether we're reaching a lot of new people or not, because I am really curious in, in this. And then, um, you know, I didn't specify what data, so like, I was thinking that maybe we would just track this off of the new cases that were open this year during the year. So, but I did not tell you how to figure that. So, um, anyway, maybe more information, a more detailed question in the future, or maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> we can talk about that at the end. Yes. Was that information? It's not no. Um, I I do have it, but it's not. Yeah, I didn't write it down, so I don't know that off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, the majority were estimated. Only a few people used data. So I think there were only maybe I want to say five or less that used data, and a bunch maybe about the same amount estimated, and then the other ones just said they didn't know how to get the information which was also an option for this question. And hence the inconsistency, right? right. The way the questions were asked. Right. Um, and you can see, again, the bottom numbers weren't that far apart, but that top number, 85 compared to 51. Um, and then just a note for anybody in the room, because I've, I'm fairly new uh, you know, to OIB tax, AWARE is a case management system, just yeah. in case you didn't know. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so you get all these new consumers because of all your wonderful outreach efforts, right? So then the question is, do you have a waiting list? Uh, in your state for instructional services like O&M, Daily Living, um, Assistive Technology, and then um, there was a kind of a follow-up that if you do, which best describes that, that waiting list? So 25 respondents said no. 17 said yes, 
and of the 17, four said that they, the um, waiting lists were in areas where um, there are open positions, five were in areas that were fully staffed, five were statewide, and three said other. What other means? I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. All right, availability of services. So are el eligible individuals in all regions of your state um, you know, receiving services? Good news is 36 said yes and four said no. Now, and I think, I don't know, Kendra, you mentioned in the beginning how many people started the survey, completed the survey? I think it was all yeah, so 30, I think it was 38 that completed the survey all the way to the end. So at this point, this is about the middle of the survey. We still had apparently 40 participants in the survey. <laughs> But you will notice that sometimes the numbers don't don't match up right, to that um, that end number. So, all right. So I think uh, that's all of mine, Kendra. I'll turn it back to you. Okay. So the next slide should be consistency in services. Let's see. How would you rate the consistency of services from professional to professional? Yes. No, go. Um, or contractor to contractor. So 20 of you said that services were consistent, 18 said somewhat consistent, and two said inconsistent. And I do think I looked at those two and they were both in contracted states and, and um, yeah, I just know from talking to those program managers that, that there's a lot, it, it's harder to manage the consistency when you have um, multiple contracting agencies that, that have different resources available as far as personnel and knowledge and that kind of thing. So this is just, just generally off the top of your head, you know, and it's interesting since we're talking about consistency. On the next slide, which type of assessment does your program use with consumers? Nine of you said that there is no standard assessment that you use. 12 said that you use a guided interview assessment. So that's basically, you know, asking open-ended questions that have short paragraph type answers that come as a result. So not super structured. Um, five said you use a pre-assessment checklist. So just a list of things that you say, are you having problems with this or this or this or this? Um, 13 of you said that you use a pre and a post assessment. So that's using the same items um, that you assess on the pre assessment and then go back and assess at the post assessment to compare those ratings. So yesterday I briefly mentioned um, the FILA project that we're working on, the functional independent living assessment. Um, so that's something hopefully news to come in the future about access to that assessment tool to help with consistency. And that is a pre and post assessment tool. Okay, so the next question. Um, there is, there is a program manager, there is a program manual for staff or contractors including intake workers, case managers, counselors, and instruct and instructors. And it describes things like eligibility, procedures, scope of service, planning and assessment, case documentation, aids and device dissemination, and referral. So we talked about this yesterday um, morning a good bit about policies and procedures. So how many of you actually said that you have such a manual? 23 of you said yes. 11 said partially and six said no. So um, we obviously have some work to do here and that's, that's okay. <laughs> um, it wasn't that long ago that some of you said you didn't have anything at all. So, you know, some of you that, that are starting to answer yes or partially to this may not have even had it a couple of years ago. So we're making progress already. On average, how many instructional 
Sessions are received by program participants. Four, receive, four states said that, you, that consumers get one to two appointments. Eight said three to four appointments. Five said five to seven appointments. Six said eight to 10 appointments. Four said 11 appointments or more. Is that surprising to you? And I looked at the four that said that they're, they're providing 11 appointments or more per um, consumer, and I didn't see any rhyme or reason to why those states should be providing more versus some of the other ones. So <laughs> I was just curious, you know, what that was. So this would be during the life of, of the open case, so while they're receiving instructional services, but you know the question as you see it on the slide is exactly what we ask on the survey. So it could be that some people were only ask, answering based on like a year's worth of time, even though the case may have been open for three years, I don't know. And others may have been answering for the life of the case, because for me, I was thinking, and. Obviously, what I'm thinking and how the question came out on paper are not the same thing. As Jennifer alluded to, we need to work on <laughs> the wording of some of these questions um, to get more consistent answers. But um, you know, I was thinking from the time you make the plan with the individual, decide on what goals they're going to work on until those goals are met and the instructional services are ended. So um, for some of you, you don't like to use the term closed, and that's perfectly fine. There's no need to have to necessarily close, but they need to be ended from their instructional program because we don't want to be counting people that are only maybe attending a peer support group a couple times a year, um, potentially. You know, they're not really receiving an instructional service anymore. I mean, you still can technically count them according to how RSA is defining things for the 7OB um, because the only the only service on that list that says if this is the only service you shouldn't count them is information and referral. Um, so technically, if they're still attending a peer support group, you could be counting them. But in my mind, we look at the instructional services. So if there's nothing, if there's not an active plan where they're working toward a specific goal, um, if if you actually have a plan and say they're working toward their adjustment still, then then yes, it's an open plan. You would be counting the the um, individual, and, and when I said sessions, I wasn't thinking about peer support groups. That's not what I'm thinking of here. I'm thinking about um, those individual one-on-one -on -one or group training um, activities where you're bringing them in and, and working with them. So, you know, some of you might be thinking, oh, it's a group training. You know, we brought them in for a week and we provided 20 sessions during that week, so we're already over that amount because we provided group training. Some of you might be defining it that way, where others might say, oh, well, that was one thing. We brought them in for the whole week. That was one session. You know, so, so how we think about these things really changes things up. So anyway, sorry for going on. Any other thoughts or questions about that one? There's a lot of different ways we can count it, and, and that's the thing. That's why it's maybe a tricky question, and I guess I was just thinking maybe based on what your staff tell you, maybe you have a sense, or from, from reviewing case files, you know, do you typically see, you know, six entries for case notes, or 10, or, you know, what are, what are you seeing on average, you know? Um, so it, it's more of a, it's not something that I expect to be particularly quantitative, even though it, it is giving a specific number because of the services being individualized. Some people may receive only one to two, while other people might receive 10 or more appointments. It's really based on their needs. So it, it is a hard one to figure out. But it, it is still interesting to just see how across the board we are on this. Okay, the next slide. Professional opportunities are made available, uh, professional continuing education opportunities are made available to staff, um, oh, sorry, by the state or contracting agency for staff who work with the OIB consumers. Um, six staff can attend on agency time, and that's like the only thing that they can do. 
um, 29 pay for um, pay for the registration for them to participate in continuing education opportunities and I believe they can also attend on the agency time so it was kind of a check all that apply for some of these um, there were five contracting agencies that did not know because it's because they contract so the, the agencies could even be different within their own state and their own program um, the next slide, what percentage of staff providing OIB services have certifications through ACVREP or NBPCB? Um, 12 states said that none of their staff have certification. Four said that 20, about 20% had certification. One said 30%. Five said 40 to 60 percent. Um, five said 80 to 100 percent. So again, um, we, I had a lot of answers. I just I said what percentage in the question, but in the box um, where I expected a percentage to be, some some of you answered one staff. So I don't know. I don't know what that percentage is. And one person said like two, two of five staff are certified. So then I was like able to figure a percentage. So if I was able to, to get a percentage out of it, I, <laughs> I made one, but, um, but yeah. And someone said like all O&Ms, well, I don't know how many, what percentage of the staff <laughs> are O&Ms. <laughs> so, so anyway, there was a lot of missing da data from this particular question. Okay, so Lisa, next slide for efficiency of case management system. And you may have alluded to this earlier, right? But the question was that the agency has a case management system that can provide data and reports effectively and efficiently, um, including 7OB data. So according to the question, it's not just do you have a case management system, but is it effective and efficient, which could be two different answers, right? Um, but it, to this particular question, 21% said yes, 9 said partially, and 7 said contractors use their own system. All right, next slide, please. So then um, taking a look at staff documentation. So direct service staff um, document all data elements uh, in the case management system uh, in order to get reports. And 23 states said yes, six said partially, and seven said contractors use their own system. And one said not at this time. Okay, so not just do you have the system, but our staff <coughs> documenting. All right, next slide, please. We thought this one was a really interesting one. So time to complete the 7OB report. So how long does it take to complete, review, and submit the annual 7OB report? So four respondents said less than eight hours. Twelve said eight to 16 hours, nine said 17 to 24 hours, eight said 25 to 39 hours, four said 40 to 59 hours, and two said more than 60 hours. It's a lot of time, isn't it? Um, and things come to mind, you know, for Folks that take less than eight hours, maybe they've been in their position a while, they're not brand new to the position, so they kind of know what to look for, they have systems in place, maybe they've got those effective and efficient case management systems, who knows. Um, for the folks that take more than 60 hours, you think about contracting space, it takes a lot of time to review all that data from all your different contractors, right? But are there ways 
that maybe you know we could all move towards some consistency in the, the a number of hours that it takes to complete. May I add something here, Jennifer? Mm -hmm, please do. Um, so I reached out to Nikki and I asked her because there's actually a statement in the beginning of the instructions that said what is um, well it, it says the estimated time burden for completing this document is and now Nikki my brain is blank I forget what you said what five hours five hours is what RSA estimates it should take you to complete this report okay and, and I'm sorry who was that again Nate. Nate okay so Nate from Alaska says he thinks it goes faster um, because they do quarterly reports to um, start getting that data together so that it's not so much all at the end of the year okay all right okay we'll, go well, we'll keep moving and we can come back to discuss it yeah, more later yes, yes. all right so we'll we'll go on to the next slide lisa um okay we're going to talk about reviewing the 70b all right so the 70b data is reviewed for accuracy by a designated and trained staff member or team within the oib program so 33% said yes, six said partially. Okay, next slide. All right, this relates to um, identifying um, match. So uh, the difficulty identifying match, the agency has no difficulty, hang on while I change the page, the beauty of Braille notes. Um, no difficulty uh, identifying and documenting match. So 31% said no, or not percent, 31 respondents said no difficulty. Four said some difficulty. And next slide, please. So when it comes to other sources of funding, um, what sources of funding were used in the past year for the older blind program um, in your state other than the chapter two funding. And so this could be, you know, um, an agency could, it could be a check all the, that applies, right? So um, 21 said, so, I can't speak either, so, social security <laughs> reimbursement. Um, 20 said uh, state funds beyond match Eight said in-kind or cash donations. Four said grants. And four said there are no sources beyond the match. So right. this was a mark all that apply. <laughs> yep. You'll notice that there's more than the 38 there. <laughs> yep. And at this point, um, I'm going to turn it over to Nikki. So, well, should we take um, questions? Let, let me just see if there's any. Yeah, let, let's give you a chance to respond to any of this because I think you'll have, I don't want you to forget if you have additional questions or comments. And um, I don't know, Sarah or Lisa, can you run the mic so we can get these on the recording? And then we'll go to next, Nikki's section next. This is Kira in Texas. This is uh, just a comment. So one thing that would be helpful in the future, um, we have a data division. So I have some data that I can provide, but a lot of that has to come from the data people. Um, and usually they, are, and they provide data for the whole Texas Workforce Commission. So they are very, very busy. So I have to give them a, a, a heads up if I'm going to ask for data that I don't normally ask for, which is usually at least one to two weeks in advance. So something that would be really helpful, uh, at least for us in Texas, is if you could provide these questions ahead of time so that I could, um, we could have the opportunity to ask for that data and then we would be able to give you a more accurate picture, you know, when you do send the survey out. 
All right, so I thought before, before we get into some data stuff, I wanted to, because there's, there's a few new people here and maybe some folks that don't know about the, I just wanted to provide an overview of RSA because some, I, I believe that some folks may not know. So um, RSA is located in the U.S. Department of Education um, and then under the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, OSERS, it's for short, um, and then RSA is under OSERS. And um, if anybody um, comes from the independent living movement, Judy Human had the position of assistant secretary under the OSERS for uh, a quite a while. So I, I feel honored and you know to be in that um, section. <laughs> so, um, so and then I, I actually exist within we call it SNPID, and it's the State Monitoring and Program Improvement Division, and we have four teams. And um, each of the teams consists of three or four program specialists, a fiscal person, and a data person. So, um, so it probably would be a good idea for anybody um, to know who the state liaison is for VR because um, you just never know where, when you may have a question that, or, or even the fiscal person, because sometimes I don't know the fiscal answers. I just got a question from Colorado actually about the um, SF-425. And I had to go to David Miller because Colorado's um, on my team. So, um, which he's one of the fiscal guys under David Steele, if you guys know who David Steele is. So, um, so uh, and just to know, so only 25% of my job is OIB, and then I work on the VR side mostly. And I got to give a special shout out to my state agency. <laughs> I have North Carolina General, North Carolina Blind. Thank you, Crystal. Um, <laughs> Uh, Mississippi Combined, Linda, thank you, <laughs> and uh, uh, Iowa General and Iowa Blind, Kim, thank you. <laughs> so, and then I, I assist with other states that are on our team. So um, back several years ago, I think it was with the passage of WIOA, so RSA had other independent living programs, a lot of the Part B um, independent living for folks with, you know, dis other disabilities, not blindness. And that moved over to Health and Human Services, so a whole different branch of the government. And um, RSA kept OIB, and so we're kind of the stepchild of RSA, I like to say, because it, and, you know, that and Randolph Shepard, we're the two uh, outcasts. <laughs> so, um, so it is interesting, but the reason why we stated RSA is because advocates. Um, really wanted to ensure that blindness didn't get mixed up with all of the monies for the other disabilities because sometimes they like to take a bigger piece of the pie. So um, anyhow, I thought that was it, good for, for everybody to know the structure. Um, so I, I get questions all the time from our Office of Planning, Evaluation, and Policy Development. That's in the U.S. Department of Education, higher up, not in RSA or OSERS. And I get questions from um, the Office of Policy and Planning, and, and both of those actually get questions from OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. So, um, and usually they come from Congress, you know. So it's it's really interesting. Um, so they've been asking me lots of questions lately because you know we we're trying to get more funding. <laughs> That's really the bottom line. We know this program is significantly underfunded. And it's, it's difficult sometimes because now I, like I, I went back through the data from 2014 on because that's what they wanted. And it was interesting that in, back in some of those years, there was some really interesting misreporting on the 7OB. And you know, the 7OB, you know, it's, it's changed iterations several times. So I think, you know, they're trying to make it more user friendly, but it hasn't been, I don't think, historically. <laughs> so, um, so anyhow, so but so what we, that's one of the things that comes to mind is so you know when we talk about you know first I had to provide some information about level funding, and I asked I reached out to some of you because I can't reach out to more than a few because then it's an uh, we call it an ICR information collection request and it's a no no in the government to um, to do that. So thank you, Melinda actually provided some great information that I was able to provide to the higher ups. Um, on the level of funding, just, just to say why we need more money. So they've come back to me and asked me lots of questions, but one of the questions was, that, so we looked back from 2014 on, 
And when you look at staffing levels, they haven't changed significantly because that's what I that was kind of my argument at first. Hey, you know, it, you know, staffing is a real issue. So then, you know, we looked again. The numbers didn't significantly change. They're pretty level across from 2014 to 2022. But so so then it became well, they're not certified professionals. They're you know underqualified to do their jobs. So it, it, it really is a, a difficult thing to try to explain the, you know, this, the, the tremendous underfunding that there is for OIB. Um, and I just, you know, what I said to them is that, you know, it's a program that's always been underfunded. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, it's, it's changed. It's always been underfunded. So anyhow, so you, you probably wonder what happens with all the 7OB data? Does it go into a black hole? <laughs> So, so um, it doesn't, I, I can assure you. So um, I, I, I just got these, I haven't memorized them. I boiled some notes and then I put them in my laptop and then I decided not to bring my laptop. So, um, so I'm gonna ask for, for Lisa's help to, um, I don't wanna, I don't wanna paraphrase here because I think you guys need to hear the words exactly. So we, we're gonna go through our objectives. So th this was developed before I came along. I think it was, you know, a part of the, uh, part of the new iteration of the 7OB. So we're gonna look at the objectives, mm -hmm. then we're gonna look at the baseline. So we use 21 and 22 to develop baseline, and then we have targets for 23 and 24. But just know that what I'm gonna do at the end of 23, once I get all the 7OBs, and thank you all very much, because I think everybody Everybody here was on time. A couple of the territories were late, but they only get 40,000, so I don't think they prioritize OIB. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, so all of you, thank you very much for getting your seven OBs. And I'm sorry for some of you who have the decimal issue. <laughs> there was more, yeah, several of you um, had, it, had, it, had an issue with submission because of that, that stupid. Uh, decimal issue <laughs> so um and, and one one other thing i'm sorry i'm speaking off the cuff but last year i i i had a goal of meeting with everybody all of the all of the oib program managers but i was i was ill for a couple of months i was in the hospital for almost a month and then i had kind of had to do rehab and i had to have a iv antibiotics and a nurse and all of that so like even though I worked in November, I don't remember it very much. <laughs> so, so just know October, November were really bad months, but I absolutely am getting, that's a priority for me this year is to get to everybody so that we can establish a relationship and you can feel comfortable calling on me to, uh, to answer questions and, and it, hopefully in a timely manner. So, so back to our objective and then our, um, our, uh, met our targets. So, um, so Lisa's going to read the objective, and then the, we're going to go through the first measure. RSA objective, to restore, improve, or maintain the independence of older individuals <laughs> whose functional capabilities have been lost or diminished as a result of vision loss or blindness. And now we're right to the measure. Measure one. The percentage of individuals receiving assistive technology devices and services who demonstrated improvement in one or more functional capabilities during the reported federal fiscal year consistent with the objectives for receiving such devices and services. Baseline for 2021, 79%. Baseline for 2022, 84%. The target for 2023, 2024, 85%. Are there any questions on that? So again, the baselines come straight from the, the 7OB. And um, I, I, I wanted to be a little ambitious, but not too ambitious when we looked at, you know, when we established these targets. All right, we'll go on to the next measure. Measure two. The percentage of individuals receiving one or more independent living and adjustment training services who demonstrated functional capabilities during the reported federal fiscal year. 2021 baseline, 78%. 2022 baseline, 83%. Target for 2023, 2024, 84%. Any questions here? 
So again, I think we're being you know a little ambitious, but not not outrageously ambitious, just to, to bring it up a little bit. All right, next one. Measure three: the percentage of individuals completing a plan of service who reported feeling that they are more confident in their ability to maintain their current living situation. 2021 baseline, 87%. 2022 baseline, 90%. Target for 2023-2024, 92%. I was really happy when I looked at the baselines on this on this measure. I think it's this this really is indicative of how much the program assists people and helps people. So all right, I guess we have one more. Yeah. Measure four, the percentage of individuals completing a plan of services who reported an increased ability to engage in their customary life activities in the home and community. 2021 baseline, 77%. 2022 baseline, 90%. Target for 2023, 2024, 90%. Right, and I'm not sure if I actually included the objective for that last one. We have one yeah, more. Right? There. Okay. Oh, perfect. Okay. RSA objective to ensure that state OIB programs demonstrate an efficient and effective use of funds to serve older individuals who are blind. And now we'll go to that measure. Measure the average annual cost per individual served through the program during the reported federal fiscal year. Baseline for 2021, $942. Baseline for 2022, $933. Target for 2023-2024, $945. Okay. 